when I'm playing not to lose, I'm no longer on offense. I'm on defense. And defense is the worst thing for a business. One, two, three, four. Welcome to the Bold Moves How Did You Know podcast, a podcast for the naturally curious who want to define their own path. Here, I'm sharing bold move stories that propelled my guests from curiosity to action, and in doing so, they've defined a path that is purposeful to them. Through these stories, I hope you'll be inspired to pursue your boldest dreams. Today, I'm excited to introduce you to Nick Powells. He's the founder and CEO of Mainland, a content marketing technology company that includes No Limit Agency, 1851 franchise and estate envy he's also the author of sticks and stones a book published by ink magazine and he frequently keynotes conferences with speeches focused on leveraging your past pains to fuel a productive and choice driven future nick i'm so excited to have you onto the show i just like stared at that the those terms because i'm like that's exactly what my audience needs a productive and choice driven future Love it. I'm excited for this too. I'm good. Good. Um, What I want to share with all the listeners before we dive into the first question is that you basically were my first boss ever after college back in 20, I think it is 2009. 2009. So we've been kind of doing this for a while. I mean, you've been doing your thing for a while and we've been both working for a long time. I cannot believe how quickly the years have passed. Uh, time has flown. I've been very proud of watching your your bold moves too. You've tried, you've dipped your hands in a few different things, and I enjoy watching from the sidelines and seeing your success. So, looking forward to our conversation. Before we dive into exactly what you're doing, your entrepreneurial journey, and all of that, um, I want to ask you about when you first um, heard about my podcast theme, right? Bold moves, or I told you what it, it was all about. Um, what came up for you? Did you have like a personal or business story that, you know, really came up for you when you heard the term bold moves? It's a great headline for what my life has been. Uh, and I continue to make these bold moves, uh, which I think on the other side of a bold move is pissing someone off. Uh, but it's, I mean, it's more of being a disruptor (laughs) because what we're conditioned as humans is you get in line. Uh, you wait your turn, uh, you do the career, you move your way up, you follow the rules, and very rarely is a bold move celebrated in traditional life. Um, so, no, I mean, it's not it's not necessarily about one story or another. It's more so like, I think those that take risks in life um, have the best shot at having an outcome of what equals happiness. I 100% agree. Actually, I don't know if you know this, but that was my hypothesis that and I I wanted to start this podcast all about the, you know, from that hypothesis that I think making bold moves requires decisiveness and and courage. And it and then when you're able to do that in your life, you're more fulfilled and satisfied. Um, So it sounds like you kind of agree with my hypothesis. Yeah, I totally agree. I do think a, a lot of entrepreneurs, uh, the first bold move is seemingly the hardest, but it ends up not being the hardest. It's the it's the later knee jerk reactions when you've you've made a decision to jump into something, and then comes a challenge, and that can mean, do I save my money? Do I spend my money? Um, how how much risk risk tolerance do I have? And that bold move ends up being the difference between businesses that take off and that don't. So you almost have, you have like bold move squared is that second outcome ends up being the second opportunity ends up being the definition of did this person really, really, really dive all in on what their original bold move was. 
we are going to talk a lot in this episode, particularly about entrepreneurial, your entrepreneurial journey. You have a lot of insight to share about business. I know a lot of listeners, when they think about bold moves, they're thinking about it from a perspective of either starting a business or doing something that may not be necessarily their own business, but something entrepreneurial in nature. And I think you have so many cool insights to share uh, about your journey and, and things you've learned along the way. But before we get there, I want you to share your founding story. If you can because it's really cool and then i'll tell you what i remember about it after you tell it um but yeah your ambition just to found uh my first place of employment which at that time was called no limit media consulting <laughs> so tell us a little bit more about you know how you came to found your own business All right so long 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 is i always wanted to own something and so before before I even get into or fall into PR, which is where where really the journey starts, uh, I was a journalist and I started a music magazine in Chicago. It was called Lumino, um, and I was like, I, I was really struggling to figure out a way how to make money with it. Now, given it was the music business, which already was an issue because there's no money in music, um, but I was like, I gotta figure out a pathway. And so I had two opportunities. One was at a PR agency that worked with franchise brands. And another one was CDW doing sales. I was like, either way that I go, I'm either going to learn how to sell better or I'm going to learn business better. Um, I was working at a newspaper and I took this job in franchise PR. And what's interesting is very quickly, I saw the franchisee story as a rock star story. I loved when I, when I was writing about rock stars, I loved talking about their childhood and what was this foundation behind them that created this fuel to create just an amazing form of art. And the reality was with franchisees, they had to go through something crazy too, because they were going to invest their life savings into business. They had no control over That's what franchising is. And so I took this job and I learned a lot. Um, and I fell in love with it. I loved the place that I was at. And so I went to the founder of that business. I said, I want to be a partner in your business. And in essence, he said, if you don't have my last name, you're never going to be a partner. And I said, that's fine, but let me give you two, or let me give you a business idea, which ended up being two business ideas. Uh, and the first one was this idea, this concept called Chai's. Everything was Fran something and franchising. Um, and now Chai's today is 1851. The foundation continued to, to grow. Uh, he said that would never work. Um, and I wasn't, I wasn't deterred by that. I was actually motivated because I was like, okay, but I, I bumped my knee. Let me get back up and give you another idea. And in 2007, um, I had toyed around with MySpace and Friendster uh, for a company called eGizmos. Uh, they were out of uh, Michigan. And could I use social to drive customers? And could I use social to introduce the brand to franchise owners? Uh, and so I wrote a business plan. It was about 100 pages. Uh, I went and pitched it to my boss. Uh, he said, social media is a fad. Uh, I said, okay. Uh, that was November of 2007. Uh, and in March, March 3rd of 2008, I quit my job, broke up with a girlfriend and moved to Atlanta uh, to start this company. Um, and that was the foundation. I was like, I'll mix social media and PR, which media consulting uh, was what that was, uh, and took a swing. And so that's a long, long to say uh, rejection ends up leading me to making that decision. Yeah, that's what I'm kind of getting at it, right? It's like so many people told you no along the way in some shape or for form, right? First, it was like, I want to partner with your business, you know, be a partner in this business. That was a no. Then it was, you know, the first idea, the business idea, that was a no. Then it was about social media. That was a no. And still yet you didn't let that deter you, which I don't know, you know, in looking back at my career and, and just kind of understanding, you know, other people's careers as well. No can be a real life changing word for people. So it's kind of interesting how you uh, just were super resilient in those moments of no. Well, yeah, and I, I appreciate that. I mean, my the foundation of this book, and not that I need to promote the dust, the dust collector is what I call it, because there's plenty sitting on bookshelves, not not being read. Um, but the foundation was uh, first or kindergarten. I walk up to school with my mom, 
uh, and life was perfect up into that moment. I knew, I knew nothing more than glorious. Everything was great. I loved everything. And she dropped me off on that first day of school. This kid called me fat. And so that was really the first like no or rejection that I received. And I cried. I didn't understand what it meant. Um, and in that moment it sucked, but later on in life, I can still go back to that moment, think about it and use it as fuel to get me through anything. I'm like, I know how I felt in that moment. It's nowhere near as bad as I feel in this moment. Therefore I can bust through. And so the whole concept is that no, or the rejection or the bullying, everybody has it. I keynoted at a conference in Vegas, uh, two nights ago. And I tell these stories uh, and people are like, why are you willing to be so vulnerable about this stuff? I go, because I think if it can help someone else find their tough moments and say, yeah, that sucked. It could be a, a shitty parent. It could be a bad situation of being bullied. It could be being fired from a job. It doesn't matter what it is. But when people reflect back on that and stop looking at it as half empty and start looking at it as half full, they can do amazing things. So I like to go back to the no's uh, and encourage people to look at them just in a different light and try to use it to motivate what they could be. It could be running a marathon, like go back and pull those no's and use that as that last fuel to get you over that last mile that you're trying to get through in this in this race, whatever race you're trying to accomplish in life. Every time somebody has told me no, uh, maybe I didn't do anything with it, you know, in that moment, but I kind of stocked it away thinking that no to me means that what that's not that path or what I'm doing now is not in alignment with where I want to go. So unless uh, something happens where, you know, there's more buy in or whatever, likely there's going to be a directional change in my life because that's where, you know, my heart is guiding me, I think. So totally get that. For anybody that's getting started in their own business or thinking about starting their own business, what can they expect from kind of day one? Let me, let me go back and I can give myself advice in those scenarios. And one is founders, there's, it's real, it's founder syndrome. And the reality is you want everybody to believe in your dream but when they don't have equity into your business, you're asking them to do something that's much greater than I think a founder understands. And so if I go back to the any of the scenarios, I had giant dreams, I still do, but I treated them differently. Like I wanted people to hustle and I, I, in the original business plan, I wrote down, we're going to make this like a Google-esque culture, which there were aspects that were there. I think we did a really good job at hiring good people that have, in many cases, built lifelong relationships. But the work, it was complex because the work sometimes didn't align with the vision. And so when you're working with franchise brands, I mean, my account team, which you were on my account team, like we had to get beat up by clients every day day and so you get beat up every day but you're confused because you love your co-workers and so then you have a founder who's crazy already who has this big vision so big vision love your co-workers those things are aligned culture is good but the clients are really tough and i think that creates a really hard environment because i mean this this is an extreme statement but it's it's an abusive relationship because on one side things are very happy on the other side it's it's really tough. And then again, like from my vision, I'm like, get on the phone, let's pitch the media, let's go get great press. And the intention was good. It was like, let's go get great press for our clients because if we can make them happy and they're nicer on the calls, then my staff is going to be happier. Like the intentions were all there, but I don't think the mm -hmm. empathy or awareness was there. Um, and so my advice is um, life is going to go very fast. Um, you're going to meet a lot of great people. Um, if you can pause and try to put yourself in their shoes, understanding that they don't have the control that you have as a founder, um, it might give you the tools to relate more to your team uh, and be a little bit more compassionate or have more empathy on working with them. Yeah, thanks. That's and I appreciate you sharing kind of your 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 perspective on that. Looking back at it, it's so helpful. Um, and now it can serve as some great advice for other people kind of trying to go through the same too. So I think, you know, you did something really smart in the beginning 
I, well, first of all, you're just smart in general with every business, all the businesses moves you make, but this, you know, you position the business, you know, PR, any client can benefit from PR, right? Like any type of company can benefit from having their name in the press, but you chose a niche and that was franchising. You've talked a little bit about it already. I don't know. I think probably the vast majority of your business today is still franchising, right? And so my question would be, why and how is it so important to lean into a niche for business growth? How did that help you gain traction? And would you continue to advise other people that the niche is where the riches are? Ooh, I like that. That should be a t-shirt. Um, all right. So I'll, I'll give two sides. To it. One is uh, you go back to early McDonald's, it's burgers, fries, and shakes. That's it. They're going to rock at burgers, fries, and shakes. They're going to make it a great experience. It's going to be consistent. And you can watch the movie, The Founder, and it tells a great, great example of it. And if you go back to businesses and the foundational elements, it's so simplistic and they're hyper-focused on one thing. Then they get distracted and you had McCafe and McFlurries and the fish filet and so things get you don't love that big flurry. I do love it. I'm not saying I don't love it. It just overcomplicates it. And so now operations, now you have to teach someone how to use the ice cream machine and, and it's always broken. Um, and so it makes it complex, but it's because we're trained as humans. If we're not growing, we're dying. And so a brand feels like they have to constantly build upon what has been done. I, on the other side, like as I look at our own business, franchising is great. But the widget that a franchise is of investing your life savings into a business you have no control over is what I would call the hardest thing in the world to sell in a career in business. It's a very complex thing to sell. And so when we've nailed what is PR and how do you leverage it, it is, in my opinion, better than any other agency can do for a regular brand because the complexities of franchising is so tough. And so there's a there's a ceiling that our business will have within franchising, potentially, if we don't innovate. So I, I say this to brands. I, I had a client at the beginning of this year, they're like, we got to get to X number of units sold because we need to do that to position our business for sale. I said, yeah, okay, you could go up, you can climb, or you could figure out how do we grow fatter. And if you go fatter, mm -hmm. then the walls will keep pushing up at the end when you've when you've strengthened the foundation. So you take a franchise brand, you can you can certainly go sell more franchises, or you could support your existing franchisees to make them more wealthy, and then they're going to grow because they're going to add more units. And so the same is true for our business. I've tried selling to grow higher or taller, uh, and every time I go back and grow fatter, we actually grow taller too. Um, and so my advice is know what you're good at. And if you're not the smartest person in the room on the next topic or the, the expansion that you want to do, then you, that's where partners allow scalability. Mm -hmm. So if you look at a law firm, they do great because they have partners in different verticals, but they're partners, people that own something that eat what they kill, that are invested into the business, that if you're going to scale, get the subject matter experts in that to help you build up the build up the walls. That's the only way you're going to be able to do it. I was going to ask you, do you have to be the smartest person on that given topic to go, you know, to be successful in your your line of business? But it sounds like you answer that question about bringing in different partners to help you expand your knowledge base. Yeah, I would say that's that's probably my biggest weakness in business. I'm not great at any one thing. I'm average at a lot of things. And so what that does is that makes me have a point of view on probably too many things, whether that's a graphic designer or a writer or uh, a media pitcher or a salesperson. Like I've done all the jobs and I've done them well or average. And so that that's a that's a threat that if I had to do it all over again, I would have probably limited my brain capacity into other categories and hired the subject matter expert in it. Um, but no, I'm not the smartest person in the room on any one topic. I'm just really average at a lot of things that makes me see the pictures. I see it in different colors.
I think one of the th one of the things, maybe the the most poignant thing that sticks out to me, at least over my career, that I learned from you, is the importance of adding value to every conversation I'm in. So I think you do this really well, Nick. Where you're in client meetings, and well, I haven't been in a client meeting with you in a while. However, I would assume that when you're in client meetings, you're always pitching new ideas. Have you thought about X? You know, um, I think that's a great strategy, but here's another angle on it, right? And so maybe it's not about like this conversation about being the smartest. It's not really about the smartest, but it's constantly adding value to those people that you're working with so that they continue to tap you on the shoulder for more ideas and more work and more whatever. What do you think about that? Is it kind of about value add? Yeah, I think that's that's anybody. I mean, think about dating. On that first date, if your then boyfriend doesn't, or that then non-boyfriend doesn't give you value in the discussion, you don't go on a date with him. And then in that first date, you don't get to date two if he doesn't give you value. And so I think it's it could be dating, it could be parenting, it could be shopping. It doesn't matter what it is. You got to constantly provide something of value back to that moment to make it count, or else we quit. Like we we will quit on things. So I do think that's it, that's important. And I I think you know when when everything is about money, uh, some of the intangibles or the real true give a shit gets lost um and mm -hmm. so when you lead with give it away and the money will come uh, in business yeah. um it it does work that way ni nice guys or nice girls do finish first yeah yeah i agree it's that uh gary vaynerchuk right it's like it's a jab jab pun? no yeah jab jab punch i think um where it's the concept of uh free free and then ask for the sell or something like that but um all right so speaking of mainland uh well yeah no limit which is now mainland right it's gotten fatter and i assume because it's gotten fatter you've <laughs> turned over the name reinvented it a little bit so what is what does it look like today what does the business look like today what are you doing for clients so N nla no limit agency which was the next level of no limit media consulting because we added more services uh Part of the reason for mainland is in the middle of the spelling of mainland is the NLA. So it was allowed, it allowed it to continue. Uh, secondly, when I was looking at the logo or creating the logo concept, I'm staring at the wall and our team had thrown some things back at me. I'm looking at the wall, I'm looking at the no limit logo, which was a light bulb. And I go, we're making mainland a hot air balloon because it was the same shape. Also, I got No Limits, tat uh, the logo tattooed on my arm. And I was like, if I have to change that logo, it's going to be a lot easier if it's the same shape. I've not changed it to my land. It's still No Limit. <laughs> um, but Mainland, Mainland ended up being a holding company over what our conveyor belt is, which is what is the why you why now? That's the consulting piece. A lot of brands can't answer that. It's very, such a simple mm -hmm. statement, but what is it? Uh, owned assets, which is our publication. Like, let's go build the owned asset to support what the why you why now is. Now let's go do PR. When we do PR, it's done with purpose because we have a why you why now and owned asset. And now we're telling the story with purpose. This is where most agencies fail. Uh, they're like, hey, we got you the Wall Street Journal and brands like, that's awesome. And that's the end of it because there's a finite number of people who read it, the Wall Street Journal or read that article. And so we said, let's put paid against that story to elevate the audience and increase the audience. So let's find the right people in the right markets, the right persona. So we added paid into there. And then lastly, we look at data analytics to understand what works and what doesn't. That conveyor belt would be very complex under a PR firm because there's too many elements. And so we said, we're going to make the holding company. The holding company is going to own the, the pieces or the, the way that the conveyor belt works. And we're going to go put that to work. And that, that happened right before COVID was really the, the turnover into mainland. And now we've, we've built a pretty solid foundation. That's so cool how, you know, you start in one place and you, you know, you continue progressing and then uh, you recognize more needs within your client base that they could use support in these different areas. And you're like, okay, that's, that's definitely and totally within our wheelhouse. You, you kind of, but you do innovate, you have to figure out how to make it work within your operation. And then you keep moving the business forward to continue meeting market need, it sounds like. Um, so this next question is about bold moves inside mainland. Um, 
And I think you actually, when I was talking to you about bold moves initially, you, um, you gave me this insight where you're like, bold moves don't just have to be made by individuals. They can also be made by businesses, right? And um, so I have a really fun example to prove out this point about a bold move that, uh, well, we did at No Limit back in the day, which was um, I, it, the, the client was Huddle House and um, we were pitching media and we wanted, you know, we obviously wanted these, this big morning show to promote the brand. And you came up with this idea that then was replicated time and time again, right? With Fox and Friends about setting up a huddle house, a literal diner on this, the plaza of, um, of, of Fox and Friends in New York City. Of course, the pitch worked. They loved it. They're like, shoot. You're going to bring all of the, you know, the full diner to our plaza and all we have to do is broadcast from outside. Where in? Where can we sign? Um, Anyway, so that's a fun, like, little example of a bold move that I remember doing within the business way back in the day. But, you know, how do you generate bold moves at mainland and like, how do you go to your clients and even get them to buy into these huge, ginormous ideas? Uh, So two things. One. Uh, I was texting with AJ the, this morning. That's the producer because uh, we have another. We're bu- we're building out a cafe there uh, in June, so we're it's still going on. Uh, Fifteen years later, um, I think it's a little bit tougher today than it was then. Now, part of that is access to information, and so if we go all the way back to the first Huddle House Diner on Fox and Friends, uh, Google Ads aren't a thing, Facebook ads aren't a thing. Facebook is barely a thing. And so you needed those big giant moments to build awareness for a brand. It's a little bit different now because digital has stepped in. Uh, The buzz term now, even though it's been around for for a long time, is AI. Um, And so sometimes those ideas, they're they're still there. But I think it requires uh, uh, some sort of perspective on what the return on investment is. Versus then it was like, go get awesome moments. Now it's like, yeah, we like it, but how much will it cost and how much can we make off of this? Um, And so the expectations have shifted um, over time. But whether, like, sometimes there's value in an idea, even if it's never executed. Like, I I remember there was uh, checkers and rallies, which you worked on uh, for a while. There was a guy that worked in our company um, in Chicago, uh, and he was like, I got a great idea for checkers. He's like, we're going to get Chubby Checker to do a commercial for them. And so he's like, they're going to do the, he's going to do the twist. It's going to be great. I was like, you're crazy. Uh, I go, I guess you could pitch it. By the end of him coming up with this idea, like while we're sitting in our office in Chicago, someone's like, uh, Chubby Checker's on the phone for you. And so Chubby wanted to talk to us about how great the idea was. Now, it never went anywhere. But the point was like, that's a memorable experience that happened. So uh, just sometimes presenting back an idea, even if it doesn't hit, is good enough. And I, I would encourage everybody to think like that. that. That goes back to your boss, too. I I had a client ask me for some advice on how to talk to his boss today about something that he's thinking about. I go, just him, just you saying this, just you presenting your idea will get you credit. Whether it goes anywhere or not, sometimes it just shows that you care. And care care is the bold move. Carry is, carry is the biggest thing that you can possibly have. Absolutely. All right. So we talked a little bit about advice for early stage entrepreneurs, those entrepreneurs who might just be, you know, got have an idea, want to get it off the ground and have started and now are trying to find that market traction. But we really haven't talked about um, advice for entrepreneurs that are five years in. Right. And I think, as you said, at the outset, Sometimes uh, the bold moves um, when you're mid business are the hardest moves. Um, they're more risky, potentially, you've got more writing on it. So what is your advice for people who are five years into their business looking at taking that next bold move? How do they get from where they are today to yeah. that the vision that they have and actually continuing to go after so it? Two, two comments. Comment one would be, uh, you're gonna exit your business, whether it's by your choice, or life exits you. One or the other is going to happen, no matter what. And 
my advice is at one year, at three year, at five, it doesn't matter where you're at. Envision what that exit is and align what your decisions are to that exit. So you want to, you want to sell your business for $10 million and you probably need to get to somewhere in the range of 3 million EBITDA to do so. Well, at least you have a North star to point towards that. So when you're making that higher, could that higher help you get there? No. Well, then at least you can point to that North star. So what advice piece one mm-hmm. is think about the, think about the exit and work backwards from that. That will help you make your decisions. The other thing that I would say is um, if you and I right now, we got in a time, time machine, a forward time machine, and we flashed you and I forward 25 years and we're now stuck there. We can't get back. The reality is we would give anything to get back to today. And so oftentimes we overlook the value of what's happening right this second because we're thinking we're rushing things too much and we might get angry at things in the moment or uh, battle some sort of anxiety or depression over us not making the money that we expect to make today. And so you think about that 25 years from now, you and I are going to give, would be willing to give anything. We'd probably cut off our leg to go back to this moment right yeah. now. And so if you don't stop and pinch yourself, you will have regrets. If you talk to someone in their eighties and say, tell me about your achievements, they would rather tell you about what they didn't achieve. And, and so we have the blueprint mm-hmm. for this as humans. We know that life is going to go fast, that life is short. And if you really want to live with no regrets as an entrepreneur, embrace that. That will help mm-hmm. you take some risks now to help you get to the, so that 20 years from now, you're like, I left it all out on the table. Because the last thing you want to do is have regret that you, you didn't do your best to achieve whatever that vision was. I think that advice stands for business, you know, going into business or just life in general. You know, if you, I I just think if you have a dream to run a marathon, right? Or you have, you want to climb Mount Everest, I don't know, whatever the dream is, if you can, can say today that you think you would regret it if you don't do it, then why wait? Just do it. Put that plan into place and get started. That's it. You're right. All right. I've got a, one more question for you. And um, it's my last question I ask all my guests. Um, what are some things that you know today about being bold that you wish you would have known earlier on? Um, I mean, it probably still goes back to my last comment. There are many moments that I played not to lose versus played to win. And if I have to find the chink in the armor, it's it's when I'm playing not to lose, I'm no longer on offense. I'm on defense. And defense is the worst thing for a business. Uh, I was talking to a client before I jumped on with you. um, And they're talking about a franchisee who's who's struggling. And they're like, they won't spend on marketing because they're bleeding cash. And I said, they're never going to spend on marketing. I go, they're praying for something that's never going to happen. They're never going to turn around this business because once the purse strings stop and you stop marketing and you start cowering, you go into the corner, there's nothing you can do. Your business is done. And that's playing not to lose versus saying, all right, maybe I need to take another mortgage out on my, a second mortgage on my home to get money so I can market my business because I believe in it. Like sometimes those big risks, those offensive risks uh, create, great moments of wealth. Uh, I saw a a session uh, with Magic Johnson. He's talking about how he didn't, he had some money from his playing career, but he spent all this time trying to convince private equity to give him some money to go work on his investments. And he finally got one to say, yes, he had been rejected three times by this, this PE firm. They gave him $50 million. He goes, I'll show you that I can make this money work. And so now he's on offense. And he buys a mall property in an underprivileged market. Uh, and he, he said like he bought it for like 20 some million dollars and he sold it for 50 some million dollars. And they're like, he's like, see, I told you I can do this. But that's because he was on offense. He he knew what he wanted as an outcome and he was willing to put everything on a line to get to it because he was confident that he would win. Sometimes that's the most critical thing. So for that's probably my biggest advice on life and in 
business and I think about it often and doesn't mean I'm perfect, but I need to play to win, not play not, not to lose. Mm -hmm. It's really good advice, Nick. You're making me think that I need to do an episode on risk aversion. <laughs> Because, you know, that for I think that's what kind of holds a lot of people back, too, is it's really scary to, like you said, take out that second mortgage. That's putting a lot at stake, even if you believe in your vision for a lot of people, you know, everybody's risk appetite is so different. So I want to explore that topic deeper, though, because it's really interesting. Anyways, um, this has really been fun. I so appreciate you joining me. Like I said at the outset, you're probably one of the smartest business people I know. So I couldn't be more excited to have you on to kind of share with the listeners your thoughts and how to become a bold entrepreneur. So thank you again for joining me. If there are people listening that need PR and marketing support um, and want to look you up, Nick, where can they go to do that? I'm the only Nick Powell's in the world. So if you Google it, you'll probably awesome. find me. Uh, so just just Google me. You'll, you'll, you'll find your way. And Kristen, I would love to go back in this time machine. I could, I can send my brain back to you and me walking outside of Herbert's and Gerbert's, which was right next door, and say, "Here, let's play. Let's play something that's going to happen 15 years in the future." We're like, get out of here! This won't happen. I know it's crazy, but like you said, I'm really glad that we've been able to stay in touch and continue our relationship even outside of a formal working relationship. It's been awesome, also watching you grow. So. Um, all right, everybody, I really appreciate your time today. If you haven't hit subscribe, please do it today. Also, leave us a review and rate us. All right, talk to you again soon. Bye. Have you visited the Bold Moves resources page yet that I've put together, especially for you, to help you discover your own path and listen to what it is that you want to do? There you're going to find resources like book a book list, um, that's going to help you embrace a bold moves mindset and some of the really cool quotes from past podcast guests that are going to just help you on what it means to take bold moves in your life. Um, there's also a survey that I want you to take. I want you to finally put it down in writing. What is your bold move that you're looking to achieve next? I think accountability is such a huge part of taking a bold move. And so write to me and let me know what it is that your next bold move is. Go to kristenrocco.com slash bold dash moves dash resources. I'm also linking the URL right there in the show notes. Uh, so go into the show notes, click that link, and you'll be taken there right now. See you there. Bye.